Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, maybe even good night to you from all over the world. It's great to see what a global audience that uh, we have today. Thank you for sharing that in, in the chat. Uh, I'm Peter Hurst. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Executive Education here at the Sloan School, and I'm thrilled to be joining you for the uh, next installment of our Innovation Network webinar series, where I'm joined by our fantastic colleagues, uh, Scott Stern and Erin Scott, uh, who are going to be talking with us about strategy for startups. Now, I know that some of us might have thought that those are two words that we wouldn't expect to see next to each other, strategy and startups. Uh, but I uh, am confident that by the end of this hour, uh, we'll have much deeper insight uh, and uh, have shared some ideas, heard from uh, Scott and Erin, and also we hope heard from you in the chat and the Q&A. As Lauren asked, please do feel free to uh, put those things through in throughout. Um, so if we could move to the next slide, uh, please. Uh, today, um, here we are. We have uh, Scott and Erin's uh, bi short bios here. Uh, you've all seen these, of course, because uh, you signed up to be with us today. Uh, Scott is a professor uh, in, uh, in strategy uh, at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Uh, and Erin Scott is a senior lecturer uh, also in uh, strategy, entrepreneurship uh, and management at the Sloan School. Uh, between them, they have enormous experience, uh, not only of, uh, researching and studying, but also helping uh, startups and entrepreneurs and also large companies uh, to uh, be much more successful than they would have been without these insights. And we hope we'll be doing that uh, for you today as well. And so with that, uh, I would like to hand, to hand over shortly to Scott. Uh, I think we'll start uh, and we'll be hearing why strategy matters for startups, how to balance the process, uh, of learning and experimentation uh, with the need to make choices. Uh, what are the choices that startups face? Uh, and how to use uh, what we call the entrepreneurial strategy compass to see how those key choices fit together into your overall entrepreneurial strategy. Uh, so with that, Scott, if I may, uh, I'll hand over the keys to you and I'll be back uh, in about half an hour, or a little longer than that, to help pose to you and Erin some of the questions that have been coming in while you're talking. Great. First, thank you so much, Peter, and thank you to our uh, colleagues in executive education. Um, it's just wonderful to see this incredible global community uh, joining us online, and we're really delighted to be launching uh, this course, Idea to Impact Strategy for Startups, and to be participating in this webinar uh, over the next um, hour. And so um, we're gonna keep you uh, lively here. So definitely keep on with the chat. I see people from all around the world, including some places I wish I could be with you uh, right this very second, but uh, keep it lively in the chat as well as in the Q&A. And we'll try to do our best uh, to address those questions, um, both uh, uh, within the webinar um, and as we continue forward. So just to get things going, why don't you put in the chat who you think this is? That's, what, what did you think when you saw this? So, oh, look at this. I see, oh, I see from Luciana, I see a guess of Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse from Mark Copsey. It turns out that is not Mickey Mouse. This is Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, Walt Disney's first great creation. And this was actually, right? So Walt Disney actually had this idea. He was relative to what was going on at the time, he understood and had a hypothesis that animation should be family oriented. It should be for children. And the particular characters that he created, most notably first, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, were the way that he brought that idea to life. And as part of building out his Oswald the Lucky Rabbit stories, he built a great team of animators in California and he worked with a downstream distributor, Mintz. And Mintz actually kind of sold the, um, the, the shorts that would appear at the front end of say a Charlie Chaplin movie to others um, in the movie business. But like many entrepreneurs, Disney faced a problem that he actually had a not very good partner in Mr. Mintz. In fact, Disney went, uh, took a train trip from California to New, New York, to renegotiate his contract with Mintz, where Mintz looked at him and said, Walt Disney, I don't know why I'm even having this discussion. 
you're a mere entrepreneur. I love your character, Oswald, and I love your team, but I don't know why I'm negotiating with you as part of this equation. And in fact, first, I, my agents in California have actually gone and recruited a bunch of your best animators to actually form our new own production studio. And let's be clear, they weren't bad. Those were the people who ultimately made Woody Woodpecker and ultimately Bugs Bunny. And also, Mint said, not only, right, you know what I'm saying, have I already taken your team, but you're not a very good negotiator. In fact, the copyright for Oswald the Lucky Rabbit rests with me, Mr. Vince, rather than you, Walt Disney. And so many entrepreneurs faced with that problem, that basically Disney's entire business was taken away from him. Many entrepreneurs would just say, oh my goodness, time to give up, or I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe, you know, just kind of randomly kind of go out in different direction. Well, Disney actually took a step back and he recognized that his underlying idea, animation for children, was sound. But not only that, he recognized that to proceed, he needed a strategy that would overcome the challenges that he had learned to his great regret in his interactions with Mr. Mintz. And he literally wrote in his diary that he needed to come up with an innovation, a new technology that would not allow, no, allow him to maintain control over he, his company, and his characters going forward. He went back to California and with his now half team, he went back and he created sound cartoons. Mickey Mouse, the reason we know Mickey Mouse today is that Mickey Mouse was the star of the first sound cartoon, Steamboat Willie. Not only that, to the day he died, Walt Disney would always say, it all started with a mouse. And what he meant by that was that it was the moment where he went from Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and the failed strategy for his idea to Mickey Mouse sound cartoons and the approach that he ultimately took forward was really the founding moment for the scaling and success of the Walt Disney Corporation. Why am I starting this very brief webinar with a kind of long story about a story almost a hundred years ago? And the answer is because the Disney story encapsulates the core challenge that every entrepreneur, every person doing a new business development faces, which is first, of course, it's important to come up with good ideas to build a great team, but then we have to figure out a strategy for realizing the potential to create and capture value from that idea. Entrepreneurial strategy is about choosing among different alternative visions for an idea and company. And so even just in the chat, and um, in, in the, in the uh, uh, well, actually, I think that actually we're gonna be here at a poll. Um, if, um, Lauren, if you could just launch the poll, what I want you to do is kind of take a little poll just to keep things lively here, right? When you think about entrepreneurship, what do you think is most important? The quality of the idea, going and getting some financing, team strength, or the ability to translate that idea into execution. Oh my goodness, we are really doing well here. Apparently this is a group that likes strategy for startups. 90% the ability to translate the idea um, into execution. And what I like is financing, of course, important for accelerating an otherwise good strategy, but financing serves strategy rather than the reverse. Let me just say why I think this is so important. The challenge of innovation-based entrepreneurship is not only about coming up with those great ideas, it's choosing how to implement those ideas in a way that creates and captures value. And why is that so hard? I think it's useful to step back and think about the advice we usually see given to entrepreneurs, to people doing new business planning, to entrepreneurs within established organizations. So there's one kind of advice, which is very action-oriented. Right? Here's Richard Branson. If you're looking to become an entrepreneur, don't go to business school, just get on out and do it. 
Now, he doesn't tell you the it to do, but there's a kind of advice that says, if you would like, if you know in deep in your heart what to do, we need to just focus on prompting action. Of course, there's a separate type of advice, which is about very deliberative planning. For those of you who have been involved in strategy roles in larger organizations, whether or not it's Porter Five Forces or Blue Ocean or whatever it might be, all of a sudden the idea is I can step back, I can write reports, I can go and gather external data, and I can weigh the benefits and costs of alternative strategies. But what happens when I simultaneously am choosing what to do, but also the actions I undertake to learn what to do shape the, the path that I'm in actually pursuing. And that's what we call the paradox of entrepreneurship. The key for to strategy for startups is figuring out how to learn enough about alternative paths to make a decision without actually pre-committing to a particular path before that learning is done. In other words, we have to view strategy for startups as testing and experimenting with our entrepreneurial hypothesis, our hypotheses about how to create and capture value. Essentially what entrepreneurial strategy is gonna do, and we'll, um, you know, we'll kind of double click on this in a whole bunch of different ways. It's the sequence of choices a founder and team makes to test specific value creation and value capture hypotheses when entrepreneurial experimentation requires partial but not complete commitment. And in particular, there's a kind of key insight that we develop within that, which is that for most good ideas, there's not a single path forward. There's in fact many potential viable paths. And very often the trick to strategy for startups is not finding the one true path, finding a single epiphany, but instead surfacing multiple paths, identifying which one's most closely aligned with the passion and the unfair advantage of the founders, and in fact, leaving alternative, perhaps, perhaps potentially valuable paths behind. We use that insight, this is in the context of a broad range of research and practice that we've done both with you know, literally thousands of startups at this point and you know, kind of articles at every kind of different level uh, with our collaborator, Joshua Gans, and of course my collaborator here, um, Aaron Scott, on an overall framework for strategy for startups, for entrepreneurial strategy. And that is first, that our choices matter. And understanding in particular, which of our choices, what are the most, critical domains that I have to undertake learning and experimentation first. And then when I look across these different elements, customer, technology, team, go to market, how do I bring those together as part of an overall entrepreneurial strategy? Because these choices matter together. So why do I spend so much time on this idea? Why do we spend so much time that our choices matter. And in part that's grounded in the nature of the, of the kinds of decisions we face when we're building a new type of business that has many potential directions we could go, but we are uncertain about which direction to choose, right? So first idea is there's more than one potential path to create and capture value from a given idea. For most good ideas, there's in fact many potential ways to go. So for example, here on the left is Howard Schultz. Many uh, of us consider him the founder of Starbucks. He actually wasn't the founder of Starbucks. He was an early employee of a company called Starbucks. The idea behind Starbucks was to bring European style coffee to the United States. And you can see the actual original founders there on the right. Their initial strategy for bringing European style coffee to the United States was to actually kind of sell people kind of coffee beans and then have people make up their coffees, their cappuccinos or espressos at home on a French press or whatever it might be. So very high margin business, 
expensive beans, kind of very kind of artisanal surface with each customer. Howard Schultz was then sitting in a cafe in Milan, don't we all remember when we used to visit cafes, sitting at a cafe in Milan and he realized that there was another part of the European coffee experience that was missing from the United States, the cafe. And so he went to the founders of Starbucks and he's like, we should open up a cafe. And they said, no. They said, we're, we're, we're focused. We're focused on this coffee beans business. But Howard Schultz, being entrepreneurial, undertook an experiment. There were at that time three stores for Starbucks. He took one of them and literally transformed it into a cafe. And within literally two weeks, there was a line around the block for getting prepared coffee drinks and sitting in a kind of nice environment. Oh my goodness. Goes back to the founders of Starbucks, reports on his great experiment, and they look at him and they say, what have you done? And he's like, I did this great experiment. I showed you that the cafe idea worked. And they said, you're fired. We really are committed to this, the coffee bean concept rather than this other thing. And you've made our core customers wait in line for an hour around the block while you're serving somebody up a Frappuccino. Howard Schultz ultimately founded his own cafe, Il Giornale, two years later bought the Starbucks name from the founders as he scaled the firm. Interestingly, those other founders, people often hear this story, they're like, what a bunch of losers. They ended up being instrumental in the scaling of Pete's Coffee, a much more bean focused, much more about the coffee quality rather than the cafe experience version of the same idea. There's more than one way to create and capture value from a given idea. But of course, an entrepreneur cannot pursue all paths at the same time. Fundamentally, they face constraints on resources, on time, and even strategic constraints. Here's Anita Roddick, the founder of The Body Shop. Anita Roddick, very early on, she almost fell into entrepreneurship almost accidentally, but she built her business around the concept that she was against the supply chain approach of the traditional cosmetics industry. She didn't believe in animal testing. She was looking for natural products and she wanted pe women to be uh, happy with how they look, but was not into the beauty business in some sense. And interestingly, as she scaled, she got all sorts of offers from investors who said, we love what you're doing. We love the vibe, but it'd be much more efficient to do animal testing to create better products. That's a much more efficient R&D approach. And she looked at them and she said very simply, I cannot simultaneously be a neat erotic, the body shop committed to ethical products and also do animal testing. You can either be the animal free company or you can test with animals. You can't be a little bit of both. Okay, so now we've surfaced the idea that there are often multiple ways to create and capture value. You can't do them all. And that means we have to sort of search around for a way to make decisions. And the key insight is that at the very earliest stages of a new idea, entrepreneurs are super uncertain about what to do. They're uncertain about whether or not their idea is good. They're uncertain about which strategy would be best. And in some sense, that actually has that notion that you're both searching around around the quality of the underlying idea, but also trying to figure out a strategy that works for that idea has very surprising consequences as kind of detailed practical consequences for how to found and launch an effective startup. When Jeff Bezos in 1993 was given an assignment by his boss, um, it was an assignment by his boss, he was working in the finance industry at the time, and his boss literally said, there's this thing called the internet, we're in finance, I want you to write a report for me about whether or not the internet will affect finance and you know, kind of come up with a business plan around that. So new business development. 
And Jeff Bezos was very smart and very driven at that time. He was obviously very young. And he went out and he very quickly came up with a business plan. And that business plan roughly would look like what we call E-Trade today, founded by great Sloan, Sloan um, alum, right? But, right, he came up with this. And he ran the numbers. He ran a kind of simple calculation given the growth rate of the internet, how the internet would disintermediate finance. And he realized it was an incredibly profitable opportunity. But what distinguished Jeff Bezos was he realized that if the first vertical he looked at for this new thing called the internet was incredibly profitable, that there were probably other verticals that might also be profitable. And he literally completed more than 20 business assessments of different verticals, anywhere from electronics to clothing, dot, 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 and ultimately chose books as the first best option because he believed it maximized the number of items that could in principle be available from an everything store relative to the number that you could fit in a physical bookshop. And obviously over time, he then scaled into many of those verticals that he had initially explored. So one thing that Jeff Bezos came to understand was that what you wanna do is search and understand kind of does, is this kind of core idea are there, are, in fact, are there multiple ways that it might work? And that very surfacing makes you confident in the value of the idea, but of course makes it very challenging to choose between the alternative paths that you're now surfacing. And so then the last key insight is to recognize that we need to take an experimental approach, but even those experiments are gonna be pretty noisy. So here are two Sloan grads from the mid 2000s, Heidi uh, Zach and David Spector. They were both working in Silicon Valley and Heidi in particular kind of came up with the idea that her sense she would, I think was a, she had been at Google, she had decided that the bra industry was just broken. That most women were wearing bras that were just the wrong size. And certainly there was no great online experience for bra uh, uh, sizing and uh, purchasing at, you know, at that time. And so interestingly, she, her hypothesis was that most women were just unaware of the size of their bra. And she actually, along with a fashion designer, conducted an actual online experiment, very respectfully and tastefully, but nonetheless done in a way that allowed a group of women to in real time figure out their bra size one way or the other. What she discovered from that was something that she had not expected that actually reified her entire strategy was that it turned out that not only did most women not know their size, but for many women, the appropriate size was not available. And that led she and her team to develop the half size bra that has become the cornerstone for Third Love, one of the most rapidly growing brands in that space over, in fact, the fastest growing brand in that space over the past decade. So how do we bring all this together? Is we have lots of options, can't do it all, we're uncertain and we're trying to learn. And what that combines to is this paradox of entrepreneurship, is what role can we, how can we prioritize our choices and sequence our experiments in a way that let us learn as much as possible surface multiple plans, but ultimately make, choose a path that, we're, that allows us to get to market and grow and create and capture value, right? Entrepreneurial strategy is the sequence of choices we make to have specific value creation and capture hypotheses. And that really, you know, kind of just, uh, I'm about to kind of pass it off to Aaron here, but in fact, at the core of this insight is to recognize that for those, when you are struggling with what to do, you want to say first, can I see multiple paths forward? And interestingly, it's exactly when you're struggling with multiple viable paths forward that it may be time to choose because the essence of entrepreneurial strategy is choosing a, a viable path that allows you to create and capture value often means leaving, choosing what not to do, often means leaving some potential paths behind. 
I'm going to leave it off to my great colleague and collaborator um, on this work, Aaron Scott, to take us forward from here. Great. Thank you, Scott. So let's dig in further to this idea of why choice matters for entrepreneurs in practice. So imagine that you have an idea. Let's, let's go through this with a stylized example. So your idea here is, is the light bulb. And if you look closely, you can see that the filament is, a, is DNA. So imagine you yourself with your skills, your passion and your advantage, you have this particular idea that you want to move forward with. And you can implement that idea through the implementation of some specific strategy. Let's call this the blue strategy. We in fact know how to do that. There is an incredible amount of research and practice about how to move forward along this line. This is an investment decision. And so we know how we can break that idea down into a series of investments to really explore that idea. In fact, we can do a little experiment first. We can call that the little blue light bulb. And by doing those series of, of little experiments, we can learn more and stage our investments over time. Each time that we get good news, we can kind of further commit. You know, this is very much venture capital in, in practice. Um, and if we get bad news, we can then stop um, those investments. But I have a question for you guys in the chat. What do entrepreneurs do when they get negative feedback on an idea? Do they abandon the project? Or do they shift directions? What examples have you guys done in, in your careers as entrepreneurs or have you read about? Right, so what we're seeing in the chat is that entrepreneurs are not, are not abandoning their ideas when they get bad ideas or bad feedback from the experiment. In fact, they shift. Um, and so if you view entrepreneurship as an investment problem, as opposed to a strategy problem, you would believe that when we get bad news, that when we face some kind of failure, we should in fact shut down the, the, the project. But in, that's not what we see in practice, right? Is that entrepreneurs pivot to the red light bulb. But there's something interesting here. If you went down that blue path and you started making commitments along that blue path, before you received, in fact, the bad news, then you may, in fact, be pretty far away from that red path. In fact, you may still even be far away from that red experiment, that little experiment to learn more about the red path. And so with this interesting insight, which is that the process of learning about blue can make red unviable. And so the key insight of choice matters is that we really have to think about how to trade off this process of learning and experimentation, which we all know is really critical to entrepreneurship with this process of strategic commitment along these paths. And this is why choice matters is incredibly important for, for entrepreneurs. And this insight is gonna help us think clearly about the specific types of entrepreneurs face. And the most critical choices that we find are who are your customers, how do you innovate? How do you organize? And how do you compete? And underlying any entrepreneurial strategy is a set of value creation and value capture hypothesis. And we're gonna realize these, the strategy by making a series of interconnected choices related to customer, tech, organization, and with whom and how to compete. So let's first dig in to just the customer and really briefly see what this looks like in practice. So our favorite ad uh, in the entrepreneurial strategy group here is this, is this ad, Pratt's Healing Ointment for Man and Beast. And I think you can see if, the, if your customer is both man and beast, you have not chosen a customer, right? And so we want to think, okay, how do we choose customer? And there is, you know, some really great work that helps us think about how we choose a customer. And, you know, the, the pragmatic knowledge here is that our choice of customers is this search for the ideal beachhead market that really lets you ride as an entrepreneur this path to the mainstream market. And that's, you know, the, that is what we kind of, why, why we want to really make a series of process to pick the right beachhead market. And so let's look at this in practice with respect to, you know, an innovative company that's come out more recently. So consider the choices of 23andMe in their early days of founding. You know, at that point, I think it was in 2005, their really nice, their light bulb moment was how can we leverage the insights of the Human Genome Project 
in particular, low cost genetic testing. And there were two different things they could have done at that time. One is they could have worked with physicians and the FDA to enhance prenatal genetic screening, right? That is incredibly valuable. Many of us you know, have, have leveraged that these days, but at that time, that was one path they could have chosen. And on the other hand, they could have focused on really consumer-focused ancestry research, including you know, helping people identify unknown relatives and surprising traits. So these were two different paths that they considered in those early days. But note, much like the blue light bulb and the red light bulb, these are very different paths at that stage. Choosing one of these would take us further down that route as we scaled. We'd make very different hires, we'd build out different products and engage in different partners as we move that uh, forward. And so by choosing one beachhead over the other would mean that we would lead down a path of different markets and we'd have to leave other markets at least temporarily behind. And so for a given idea, there are multiple equally viable S-curves, not one beachhead that we're in search of, but multiple. And your choice of beachhead, in fact, shapes what mainstream market you need to achieve. And so what we have done is we have developed a series of, of workbooks around each of these four key choices, which help you weigh not only this learning process versus commitment, but also the trade-offs of different beachheads and the markets that they will be achieving. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna link all these choices, these, these four important choices together. And in particular, we're gonna think about competition. We're gonna say for a given idea, consider with whom and how you're gonna compete. And that's gonna give you what, what we call the entrepreneurial strategy compass. And so that's what you see here on the slide in front of you is the idea that light bulb is front and center here. And what we have found in, in our research is if you orient with respect to competition and with the idea at the center, that there are four common strategies that startups use. The intellectual property strategy, architectural strategy, disruption strategy, and value chain strategy. And that each of these reflect a different set of coherent choices. And these we walk through in far more detail in the, in the course itself. And so let's walk through what we will be doing in the, this course. And um, so the key kind of takeaways from this course is to really have a deeper understanding of these core strategic choices facing the startup innovators. So digging far more in detail about how we're making those trade-offs and how we're committing to one path over the other. We have a synthetic and actionable framework for really developing your strategy and then implementing the strategy, particularly in dynamic environments. Provide uh, key insights and required to really then scale those ventures over time. And most importantly, a methodology for entrepreneurial experimentation that allows for successful skilling, scaling over time of the venture. And so we found that course participants that find this particularly valuable are not only entrepreneurs, but also early stage employees, investors, corporate entrepreneurs, and those that want to bring kind of a more entrepreneurial mindset uh, to, their, to their business. And so in the first day of the course, what we do is we really dig into these four choices. So customer, tech, organization, and competition in far more detail. On the second day of the course, we then go into these strategies in more detail and, and weigh the differences and the trade-offs among those strategies. And in particular, think about entrepreneurial experimentation with respect to the trade-offs you're making vis-a-vis -vis, uh, commitment. And then we apply that to a number of really great cases. So most of these cases, or all of these cases, we have written particularly uh, for putting these tools into practice. Uh, very diverse from a number of different fields. So you can see those, uh, you know, see them put in practice across industries over time. And so one case that just as we kind of wrap up and move to Q&A that I think, you know, want to end with here is Rapid SOS. So these were two entrepreneurs within our ecosystem. So Michael Martin was down the road at HBS 
and Nick Horlick was here at MIT. And they came together, actually at the Dunkin' Donuts across the street, uh, with a very kind of valuable and, and sim simple idea in, it, in its thought, which is they both noted that they could get an Uber immediately. And that Uber would know exactly where they were and have all the information from their phone. They could also get a burrito or any other town of takeout and immediately have it brought to them. But when it came to situations that were the most important for emergency situations, all of that information on their phone was not being transmitted to emergency responders. And what they wanted to do was bring 911 calls into the smartphone age. They wanted all of that information to be accessible to first responders themselves. And so in those early days, they were considering many different paths on how do we take this idea, this incredibly important idea and make it into impact. And you can imagine that one way they could have done that is that they could have created kind of a backend uh, that maybe insurance providers apps would allow uh, for, for kind of 911 to be uh, called through, their, through that app as well, or working with other established firms to really uh, provide more information uh, to 911. Alternatively, they could have created a standalone app that kind of disrupted uh, uh, the industry and automated 911 uh, connection in case of a real-time emergency. And in fact, there were multiple different strategies that they could have considered, but they knew that if they wanted to go forward, if they wanted to really bring this idea to fruition, each of these paths had subtly different value creation and value capture hypothesis and required a distinct set of choices. And they needed to commit to one to, to, to really realize that and test to that. And that would require leaving these other routes behind. And now today, if you, in the, you know, 92 to 98% of phones in the United States, if you are calling 911 from your phone, you, know, you are using rapid SOS technology and increasingly around the world as well. They have been able to translate their idea into impact and have been, you know, continue to grow and be successful by being committed to a certain strategy and moving forward along that. Most important, for, I think, for them is that they've really, day in and day out, been able to save lives by translating this idea and bringing it forward. And so in wrapping up, you know, the power of entrepreneurship is the ability not only to identify and implement exciting opportunities, but to make choices, just like Michael and Nick, that allow you to create real value for the world, as well as capture value for your stakeholders. And as Scott noted, the more exciting in the innovation, the more promising the innovation, the more in fact important it is for strategy to, to really help you commercialize and build that new company with competitive advantage. And so the process of choosing an entrepreneurial strategy requires a venture to come to terms with the core value that it will create and have a disciplined logic of how it will capture value on a sustainable basis. Thank you very much. We will now open it up to, to Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Scott and Aaron. This was fantastic. And first off, let me say, I'm, so I'm convinced that uh, entrepreneurs need to understand strategies and, and implement it in, in ways that perhaps uh, we weren't uh, thinking. So you asked, you've, you've answered what would have been my first question. But actually, I'd like to pick, on, pick up on something uh, that you said in the presentation and riff off a question that Eduardo has asked in the Q&A uh, about the, the, the role and the importance of access to capital. You, you mentioned a few times the, you know, the relationship and role to investors. Uh, but, but what have you seen in, in your research is the optimal strategy for entrepreneurs in uh, accessing capital and using capital, because as Eduardo points out, you can burn through your capital pretty quickly doing a lot of experiments uh, and then not have the resources that you need to actually be able to implement something. Right, and, and if, Aaron, can I, should I take this one? Go yeah, for it. Great, great. Um, great. Um, so great question, Peter, and great question, Eduardo, and I love all the comments in the chat and thank you all. Um, really important here is we, 
I think it's so important for startups and particularly for those corporate entrepreneurs who are about to maybe do you know, a spin out or whatever to distinguish between what I'd call risk capital and investment capital. So risk capital is the money that we raise to figure out our strategy. And investment capital is the money that we use to implement our strategy. And so often when we've been working with entrepreneurs, they've sort of taken a bunch of money and for example, done some acquisitions with it that all of a sudden have committed them to their path. So what they thought was an experiment, what they thought was risk capital turns into a commitment. So let me start there as being re taking the time to think about what am I doing that's on the learning side versus the investment side. This, obviously, this, the second piece of that is to not simply raise capital, but to choose your investor. The single cheapest thing is taking the time to be clear about what potential value you have, what unfair advantage your team brings to that potential idea, and wh how, what elements the early team has to bring passion, to bring implementation and passion to that idea. And then finding an investor who aligns with those values is much more important than the amount of money they bring to the venture. And then finally, as Eduardo said, okay, got it. One of the things that we do and you know, both within the course as well as within our, our broader work is talk exactly about how to, to trade off the fidelity or the criticality of the experiment versus the opportunity cost of that experiment. And being really clear that cheap testing, you know, what you're looking for is inexpensive, rapid, I saw that as well in the comments, inexpensive and rapid tests, but not any inexpensive and rapid test, inexpensive and rapid test that in fact test your most critical hypothesis. So sometimes we see startups that focus on the most critical thing, Sometimes they focus on the cheapest thing. Trying to figure out that ratio, that critical, how much will I learn on our most critical existential hypothesis is where this focus needs to be. And a lot of the other details can be figured out later. Erin, I'm not sure if you wanted to build on that. I would agree. I think just to add one point there, I think that it is, you know, a simple or a, a useful framework in thinking about how you make those trade-offs on experimentation is really being clear as to what your hypotheses are and which of those have the greatest degree of uncertainty. And then think about, okay, now which ones can I in fact test uh, effectively and cheaply? Great, thank you. I can pick up a question that uh, Solomo is, uh, is, is asking here as well. You, you talked a bit there about speed and rapidity. Uh, and you know, one of the questions that comes to mind uh, then is what are the strategies that actually uh, make it less likely that you're going to get ripped off or beaten to market? Uh, you know, and by whom? Some of the examples that you talked about were also where, you know, essentially the entrepreneur was poking the bear and got eaten by the bear before they could get off the ground. Yeah, no, absolutely. And one of the kind of things that that was... Um, where you know both our work with you know, actual startups, uh, particular you know, our work with actual startups, as well as kind of actually doing systematic empirical research, really identified that. And there's just a sort of confused conversation I think within all, very often around this, is that it's really important to distinguish between whether or not you are going to premise your strategy on control over the idea. And that's going to involve some things. Or is it all going to be about execution of that idea, regardless of whether or not you're letting the idea others take advantage of it as well? And this kind of strategic trade-off between control and execution is really important. Sometimes, particularly you say university faculty will get a ton of patents and they'll build out a whole patent portfolio, very deliberative. Well, they go slower. We have empirical evidence. They go a lot slower. We see rapid experimentation and testing often lets others take advantage of the idea. So that's a strategic trade-off. Interestingly, what we see is different types of entrepreneurs actually choose control versus execution. But in fact, the average returns to those strategies 
are in fact kind of equivalent conditional on the quality of the idea. So that's a really good example. We're, so let me just add one, two, one point to that. And the main error that we see is if you are choosing an implementation strategy, don't pretend you're in a control strategy and vice versa. So in other words, you have to think about being clear about the premise of how you're gonna create and capture value allows you to manage the problem, you know, manage the challenges associated with their strategy and also leverage the strengths of that particular approach. I'm not sure if Aaron wanted to kind of follow up on that. Absolutely. I would I would say one thing about execution strategies, you know, really building on that comment, Scott, is you need to also have a hypothesis as why the large firm, the incumbent firm that maybe you're you're going after, may be slow to respond. And it can't be that, oh, they just don't see this or they're, you know, an idiot or something. You need to be actually really clear about choices they've made, commitments they've made that may in fact make it them a little bit slower to respond such that while you're in this execution mode, you can actually gain some advantages and learnings such that by the time you poke the bear, so to speak, you're on, on better footing. Right. So, so, so some of you might have even seen we have Ministry of Supply as one of our cases, they had a great article in them about how they this great pivot ministry of supply, which is a kind of fashion tech retailer that came out of MIT. And we've, you know, kind of worked closely with them for a long time. They very much had at the core of their idea was they got ahead and they stayed ahead. They could learn, they could develop capabilities more rapidly than other people could catch up. And just note that that's different, right? They knew they were in that execution strategy. They embraced it and they executed on it. Great, thank you. Looking at a few questions here, uh, uh, people are fascinated with this contrast between uh, the, the inspirational approach to uh, innovation uh, that some of the examples perhaps have, that somebody had an inspired idea, uh, or maybe that came out of some you know, research from the lab or so forth, versus uh, the example that maybe people hadn't understood uh, was the history of Amazon with really a systematic search uh, for uh, for an entrepreneurial opportunity in your research, is, you know, is there a clear advantage of one of those strategies over the other? What would you recommend for people who uh, are really uh, energized by the prospect of being an entrepreneur, but are trying to actually figure out which approach would, should they take? Okay, and Aaron, do, do you want to take it, or I can start? If you want to start, that's great. Yeah, no. So, so the uh, so. So, so the first thing I'd say, a uh, re really great, great question, Peter, is the first part is um, that one of the main observations that's both true in our research as well as in a whole bunch of now, you know, kind of very carefully done academic research in this area, as well as if you talk with VCs and sort of look through their processes um, increasingly, um, and, you know, as well, looking through the processes of accelerators, so on and so forth, is that most companies that can meaningfully consider multiple viable alternatives, that's one, that is one of the signature pieces that the company is more likely to succeed over time. So let me just, right? So, that, so, that, so in other words, companies that can point to the path left behind are more successful on the path that they take. And that's a kind of key insight about startups that research is over the past 10 years or so, but is a really important finding. I would also emphasize though, the other part of that is that some entrepreneurs, and we work with these entrepreneurs all the time here at MIT as well as elsewhere, they maybe already know what strategy they want. They have their idea, their strategy, they wanna pursue a particular path because they have the passion for that approach. They wanna implement in that way. Well, then the key for that type of entrepreneur is to understand how to make the, all their choices consistent and coherent so that they can build the interdependencies, the complementarities, they can build the kind of special sauce that allows their idea to succeed with the strategy that fits, that aligns with their passion and with their objective. Aaron, I'm not sure if you want to build on that. Yes, I think, you know, going back to, to what Scott mentioned, which is that for good ideas, there are often multiple paths. 
And so I think for many entrepreneurs, it's a combination of you know, insight from a light bulb and kind of passion. And by taking a little bit more of a systematic approach early on, you will deselect those strategic routes that are not promising, but you will in fact be left with multiple paths that appear at least at the early stages promising. And by doing that, that kind of consideration, you'll actually be able to choose a path that more aligns with your passion, your interest, and in fact, your skill set. So I think it's this, this bridging of the two that is the most effective. Yeah, great. Um, a whole bunch of questions I'm going back in uh, to earlier in the, the Q&A as well uh, around different uh, sectors and industries uh, and wondering whether or not uh, the same ideas apply consistently. Some of the ones that were mentioned were healthcare, even architecture, uh, people wondering about the difference between services and products. It's a pretty broad question, but I wonder if you've got any comments on, on, on that applicability across a wide array of different industries and types of business. Aaron, why don't you, why don't you start? You know, we do see some variation of these strategies across industries, but one thing that has been particularly surprising to me is how, how almost any are very promising ideas you will often see you know, at least three different paths within that are open to them within the entrepreneurial strategy compass. I think it is thinking about the nuances within those. You know, certainly if we think about healthcare, what does executing quickly look there and learning fast um, versus maybe in other industries? I think that's to me kind of the greatest uh, difference as well as kind of what are the control mechanisms that are open to you in a certain industry versus others? Scott? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think I think that that's right. I mean, uh, and I think the one thing I would add is that obviously, if you're a biotech firm, even if you're execution oriented biotech firm, you're going to get some patents, but it's not going to be the core of the strategy. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not going to be everything depends on that. You're going to be willing to do deals before the patent is granted, which will save you a lot of time. So, in other words, conditional on your sector, conditional on your vertical this compass, right? You're in the now, right? The compass places you in the center. It's a compass, not a map in some sense. The other lens that I would add to that is just to say that one of the things that we've discovered, I think this is mostly in our, I would say less in our empirical research is really working with entrepreneurs is simply surfacing real opportunities allows people to gain a insight into where, what's missing in the marketplace. What's not being served? What are the pieces? What is the way that you're going to be able to do something that the established firms are not going to care about for a while? And maybe that can be the foundation for success going forward. So I always think of a company, you know, a good MIT uh, spinoff is Qualcomm. When Qualcomm got started, people thought that intellectual property could never work in the telecom industry and you couldn't work as a standalone company in telecom. Well, 25, right? Now Qualcomm, you know, established itself as one of the leading companies in the entire sector because it took a strategy that actually violated the conventional wisdom of the industry at the time. Absolutely. And I would say by surfacing these different strategies, don't be too quick to say this won't work in this industry because even taking the time to say, why wouldn't let's work through these hypotheses that would need to be true for it to work can help illuminate actually facts about other strategies that you also need to be careful about. Really good point. And are there also differences between industries uh, in terms of the what the business environment or the policy environment is? A highly regulated industry, for example, might be much more difficult to do something innovative in. So, so, so one of our favorite, you know, which we'll do in the course is uh, <laughs> former students of ours, uh, Socrates Rosenfeld, who is an MBA of Fantat, right? Uh, has built out a very large player now in the cannabis space. That, right, Jane Technologies, they are the essentially um, digital storefront for about two thirds of cannabis uh, uh, dispensary, you know, legal cannabis dispensaries in the country. The core of that case is one insight that's, that Socrates had very early on as we were writing the case right at its founding was he recognized that actually big players like Amazon or the pharma companies or even the beer and wine companies were prohibited from entering the space because of regulation. 
And that gave him a little bit of a pathway as a startup into that space, but also meant that he has to sort of think very hard about that policy environment. So really great question. You could, you know, we only have three or four minutes, definitely worthy of a very long conversation. But one of the things that we see very often is that startups are able to be super creative about how to use the regulatory environment to find, you know, to find a way to establish that foothold and then navigate and scale. You know, we wrote a case uh, right at the founding of PillPack, another MIT spinoff uh, that was ultimately acquired by Amazon. And I remember sitting with Elliot Cohen very early on where he realized that, you know, along with his um, co-founder, TJ Parker, he realized, oh my goodness, every single state has its own particular set of regulations about online pharmacy, every single state. And so he had, and what he did is he put it on the shoe leather and literally figured out how he could then get basically approved in each state. And then, and this goes back to that financing question, that was, that itself, once that strategy was chosen, then external capital was really helpful in helping them implement their 50 state online pharmacy solution, which ultimately now has become a leader in the industry. Absolutely. Great. Maybe in the closing minutes, uh, you know, you mentioned that a lot of the research that you, you, you base this work on, these ideas goes back, you know, o- over more than a decade. Uh, but thinking about, you know, the last year uh, in particular, which, you know, has had many uh, challenges, including a reassessment for a lot of people about you know, what our social uh, purpose is. Uh, what do you see as you look back in the research that might be uh, helpful to those that, of us who are now thinking that you know, we want to really, as you said, ideas to impact. It's the impact that people really care about and particularly doing that in a way which you know, is uh, socially beneficial in some sense, as well as uh, economic, economically successful uh, for the entrepreneur. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's, a, great, that's a, great que- a great question, Peter. Um, I would just mention one thing, which is that I think coming out of this pandemic, uh, one, we're gonna be a much more attentive to the value of our public health and our public health infrastructure. Thank God we had been investing for 35 years at the NIH and the SBIR program in mRNA technology, which all of a sudden is gonna be finally the thing that allows us to get past this. So that's one piece of that. But even more importantly, I think, is the idea that ultimately companies work when you're right, particularly startups always have an opportunity to create value when they combine the actual impact, the intended impact of the founders that builds on their experiences, their, uh, their networks, that builds on the things that they bring to the table, but then combines that passion and experience with the ability to take an experimental learning approach that ultimately surfaces and allows for the implementation and scaling of a strategy to impact. So in other words, passion without implementation, I think is frustrating. Implementation without passion will always fail because you'll give up, first hard thing that comes up. And it's when we see that combined that we see such uh, value. And I'll just go back. You know, I was just on a call with our friends at uh, Rapid SOS, our, our colleagues at Rapid SOS, and you know they've seen they've seen their ability to scale dramatic, dramatically amplified over the course of this pandemic, and they are they they see people wanting to work for them as a scale up because they know that it's aligning with those goals. Sorry to go on for so long. Great, thank you, Aaron. We're just about out of time, but if you've got uh, thirty seconds of uh, closing comments on, on, on that or anything else that you'd like to? Yes, I would just double click real quickly here that what Scott said, which is that passion makes it all the more important that we be thoughtful about our choices so that we can in fact make that impact. Great, Aaron Scott, Scott Stern, thank you so much. This has been a, a really amazing session. Uh, we really appreciate it. A lot of people are excited by uh, this last hour and also by the upcoming course. 
Uh, I'd also just like to bring everyone's attention to our next webinar, uh, which is going to be on the subject of nimble organizations, which seems to flow very nicely from the discussion that we've been having today. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, uh, Scott and Erin and the uh, MIT Sloan Executive Education team for producing this uh, and bringing it uh, to the world. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. Uh, keep on innovating out there and uh, please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much.